All right, you guys are good. Awesome. Well, on a Henley, a choke mop. No, 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 it's one o'clock. There's no, there's no good mornings anymore. Well, howdy to everyone. I'm Ryan Spring. Um, and with us, we have Mike Federoff. And I did not bring up his bio, so I'm going to let him talk about himself. I'm going to let him introduce himself. Well, thank you, Ryan. Uh, my name is Mike Federoff. Uh, I am a Mississippi native, um, and I have lived and worked in the Southeast for many years. Uh, also a student of anthropology. And I appreciate being invited here today to talk about one of my favorite things, which is food. Um, and I've had the uh, the opportunity to work with Ryan and Ian Thompson and their shop at the Historic Department at Choctaw uh, in the Pine Hills of Mississippi for some years. So today's talk uh, is about earth oven cooking. And let's change the slide here. And where we're talking about is uh, located in the Pine Hills region of Mississippi. Got a map here on the screen. Um, the little flags you see on the map are locations of archaeological sites that archaeologists have identified in the Pine Hills with uh, what we think are clay sandstone features representing earth ovens. Um, this is kind of a, an important discovery because traditionally a lot of archaeologists thought the Pine Hills were barren of archaeological materials or people living there for any period of time. But we now know that that is patently untrue. Um, and indigenous peoples uh, have lived there and known that that place has been occupied. Um, oral traditions and oral histories have told us. Um, and so it's really important um, to think about the Pine Hills, not as a place where people were just passing through, but a place where people were living uh, and living for quite a long time. Um, the Pine Hills can best be described as uh, uplands with nice sandy soils. Um, there's animals like the gopher tortoise, um, the red-headed woodpecker, turkeys, deer, big longleaf pines. And that's perhaps probably what the Pine Hills are best known for, uh, are the longleaf, um, traditional longleaf pines that are there. Uh, the timber industry has been the mainstay of that region. Um, not just in Mississippi, but the Pine Belt that stretches from Texas, uh, East Texas, all the way up to the Carolinas. And so a lot of uh, information on the timbering industry and those sorts of things have been focused on, but it's really only in the past, I would say 10 to 15 years that people started focusing on the prehistoric populations of the area in terms of the academic settings. So this is a picture of um, what we're calling an earth oven. Um, it's a small basin clay line pit with sandstone. And this is from a site, a known Choctaw site in Kemper County, Mississippi. And what's interesting about these features is as they were discovered initially by archeologists, you know, 20, 30 years ago, when you pull the reports and look, it just labeled them all as hearths. Well, we know that these features are a lot more complicated than that. Um, uh, especially if, if you think about feasting and cooking and all the social aspects that surround that, uh, that event. Um, so, you know, when looking at these ovens in, in, the, in the literature, there's not a real big uh, discrimination between what's a hearth, what's a small basin shaped oven, what's a large uh, fire pit versus a small one. And so as we started looking a little closer at these different oven types, we saw a range um, of feature types. And this is just a shot. Um, this is from Forest County, Mississippi, out of Kemper County. This is a shot of uh, the basin shaped clay. And later on in the presentation, I'll show you how these, uh, these pits are made. It's a little bit different type of pit. This is a, a large twin earth oven scatter. Um, we're interpreting this as one side uh, of the pit is the actual oven and another side may be a cleaning episode where they're removing the sandstone out of the oven, um, perhaps to reuse it. Uh, 
which begs the question, how many times are these ovens uh, being used and how many times are you able to use them? One interesting note about the sandstone in a lot of these locations, the sandstone isn't um, necessarily right on the site. It's not what we'd call local. I mean, they're walking the sandstone in from many miles away. And that's that's important because that's quite an investment in, in building something like this. Um, so it must have been important to the people that were using it. And here's a, a picture of a nice large earth oven. And you can see the baked clay pieces inside of it, along with the charcoal. Um, now this is just one of the multiple large ovens found on this site. There were three or four huge ovens uh, or, or baking pits uh, that we're finding. And in this initial research um, that we did uh, over a decade ago now, we, we were sort of hypothesizing that they were likely cooking some type of uh, bulk processed uh, resource like uh, roots, for instance. So our initial experiments, um, we decided to test that theory. Um, so we, we used the green briar root, the Smilax root, um, as our test subject. It's, it's a root that is edible. Um, it's in ethno-historical accounts as both a feast and a famine food um, for the Choctaw and the Seminole. And so we decided to actually bake it in an earth oven um, and see what the temperature ranges of different oven sizes were and which ones uh, would cook roots the best. So how do we go about doing this? Well, before I jump into the, the science piece, I, I, full disclosure, I actually um, used earth ovens growing up in Mississippi. My grandparents uh, lived a very traditional life way, and so we would cook uh, everything from squirrels to deer meat in earth ovens um, on occasion. And so using that experience and then trying to figure out, you know, what actual temperature ranges uh, could these ovens produce in order to figure out what range of resources might have been cooked in them. For instance, were they cooking deer meat? Were they cooking roots? And those temperatures um, would be different, right? I mean, to cook a green briar root, which most of you know is probably hard as a rock, uh, in fact, there's a saying, you know, hard as hard headed as a green briar root. Um, you need to cook that root at a low temperature, low and slow for a long period of time to get the root to soften up to where you can eat it. And so I did a little a little research and I found a device called a pyrometer, um, which is what you see in the picture um, that can actually measure temperature inside of ovens. And so to make sure that it worked, I had to calibrate it. And to do that, I, I found uh, that potters, um, commercial potters actually have uh, what they call pyrometric cones, which melt at very specific temperatures. And so I would I put one of these pyrometric cones at a known melting point on the tip of the, uh, the pyrometer um, rod, and I heated it uh, to melt it to see if that matched on the reading, and it did. So I was able to calibrate the pyrometer. And then what I did was I built several pits, earth oven pits, I inserted the pyrometer, and I put different amounts of sandstone as a heating element in the pits, um, measuring everything and weighing everything to see sort of what the thermal capabilities of each of these pits were. Um, that came up with some interesting results. Uh, you know, there is a sweet spot um, for cooking green briar roots, um, uh, and it isn't the huge pits, right? It's the, it's the smaller basin-shaped ones, and it isn't a whole bunch of sandstone uh, that we're putting in those those pits, but rather um, certain amounts. So therefore, therefore, it becomes pretty important when you're on an archaeological site uh, to measure and weigh um, all of the material that comes out of these uh, earth ovens so that you can reconstruct the potential thermal capabilities of the oven. In other words, what temperature the oven can, can cook at. And so that was the first stage of the research, sort of understanding, uh, you know, what temperature ranges uh, these ovens could produce, what they looked like in terms of um, uh, in recovering them in the archaeological record, what the differences were. And then, um, you know, we started reintroducing that, uh, that idea um, uh, to folks that had the most experience with earth ovens, which were indigenous peoples. And, and working with the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, um, we've been able uh, to actually build earth ovens with the youth camps 
for several years. And so the next series of slides, what I'd like to introduce is sort of what goes into uh, a meal that you'd actually pull out of an earth oven. And it's it's a little bit more work than uh, than you would think. Um, and so this first slide, you might be wondering, why are we including sunflowers uh, in the earth oven presentation? But the seasoning that my grandma um, makes for squirrels actually uses dried sunflower seeds. And so as part of our cooking uh, event that we do with the kids, I actually grow um, large sunflowers and dry out the seeds. And so I wanted to show that, that process. Um, so for those of you listening, if you've never had a chance to grow sunflowers, it's a really cool, fun experience. Uh, if you have kids, they love it. It's a really fun way to show um, I mean, you can do it in the backyard. I, I actually have a house in a suburban neighborhood and we grow tons of these things in the backyard. All you need is a little sunlight and a patch of dirt. Um, but as soon as they, they get the, the heads of the sunflowers start nodding, you know that the seeds are, are ready uh, to pick. And so what you do is you cut them, you trim them off and then bind them together. I do them in bundles of three or four and you hang them uh, from the rafters in your barn, or your garage. I have a little sunroom where I dry mine out and then I'll crush those up and use them as part of the seasoning. And this is a picture of the umbrella magnolia leaf. Um, this is a type of magnolia. Uh, there are three main types um, in the homeland of Mississippi of magnolia tree. And this is one. This one's getting a little harder to find in the Pine Hills. Uh, you know, used to, um, you could find it a lot easier than you can now, but it, it really likes a certain soil type um, that's not quite as acidic as most of the soils you find in the uplands. Uh, so you can find it sort of in the bottoms uh, and kind of nice shaded areas near creeks. But this is used to actually um, wrap food in. And when it heats up, it shrinks a little bit, almost like shrink wrap. Uh, it, and it's kind of fun because um, the leaves are big enough, you can't really tell to scale in this photo, that if you were to cut a branch off, you can use it for an umbrella uh, if, it, if it's sprinkling. And so the old timers would call it umbrella leaf. And then no recipe would be complete without some berries. Um, I actually stuff my squirrels with, uh, with dew berries. Um, and we gather these up uh, just on the edges of um, where the pine thickets and hardwood bottoms transition. A lot of times you'll get some nice thick gnarly uh, dewberry patches. So that's a good place to gather those. And the sort of the base seasoning that I put the ground sunflower seeds in and mix the berries with um, our sassafras root. Um, and you can use all parts of the sassafras plant. If you've ever had root beer, uh, the original ingredient for root beer was um, the sassafras root. And that was actually from a drink uh, that was seen and sort of appropriated from indigenous peoples in the Southeast. Uh, you can make a tea out of the root. Um, my grandmother practiced folk medicine and made the tea all the time. Uh, so we would be out gathering these roots, um, especially this time of year. And so what you see in the picture are, are basically a ground sassafras root, which makes a filet powder. Um, it's used as a thickener use and also as a base for other seasonings. Um, the Ginobana Choctaw uh, actually sell this, uh, this uh, filet powder um, in Louisiana quite regularly. It's, it's very popular for gumbos and things like that. And then the pictures that you see are actually leaves of the sassafras plant. Um, you can eat these leaves. They taste pretty good. Uh, and you can use them to flavor other dishes as well. Um, I like them on fish. Uh, and I believe we may have cooked some fish with those leaves before, if my memory serves me. And this is palmetto. This is what's used to construct the lid, if you will, that goes on top of the oven. Uh, palmetto stands used to be um, ubiquitous throughout um, the upland pine hills, especially uh, with as many fires as the pine hills had. Um, nice, healthy uh, uh, stands of palmetto could be found fairly easily. With climate change and drought conditions, it's becoming harder and harder to find big, thick, healthy palmetto stands in certain areas of uh, South Mississippi um, that aren't directly, you know, in the coastline. Uh, this is a stand on the DeSoto National Forest. 
Um, and we actually were allowed to gather some from this stand uh, to recreate some earth ovens and actually cook some food. And the sandstone quarry, I, I put this picture in because um, there is sandstone in the Pine Hills, but the nice, what we high quality, nappable sandstone that you can actually make tools out of, there's only a few, uh, oops, sorry, it's only a few quarry locations uh, where you can find that stuff um, within walking distance of some of these sites. And like I mentioned earlier, in some cases they're quite distant. Um, so what we're finding in some of the pits are actually some of the higher quality sandstone that would have been quarried out of out of these quarry locations. So I took a picture of that so you could see the work it would take if you can imagine, you know, taking another stone and going to this quarry and quarrying stone to haul back uh, in a basket, uh, you know, to your location where you're actually building the oven. Uh, it's actually a lot of work, even with modern tools, uh, you know, with a geologic uh, pick and a buck, um, you still work up quite a sweat uh, walking out sandstone. Now, we don't quarry out of these quarries uh, to get stuff when we make our ovens. We actually go to degraded areas that have been cut through through road work and stuff like that. But I, I can I can tell you in the Mississippi heat, it is definitely um, challenging getting enough uh, thermal material to bring to the oven locations. And this is a little picture of uh, of what's for dinner. So this is a uh, this is squirrel meat, uh, wrapping it in uh, umbrella magnolia leaves in the picture there. Um, but squirrels would have been uh, something obviously available uh, to Pine Hills folks living in the Pine Hills, um, especially with the hardwood ecotone bottoms that we have. Uh, it's easy to easier to kill a couple squirrels at a time because they all nest together. Um, when it gets cold, so there are certain hunting techniques that you can use to sort of, um, you know, fill your basket uh, full of squirrels all in one sitting, so to speak. So this is something that we cooked in an earth oven. Kind of wanted you to see what you know that nest in the tree. That's where they live. If you've never seen a squirrel nest, and then we went to get the clay to line the ovens. This also was pretty labor intensive. Um, you know, getting uh, the right kind of clay. Um, the right amounts of clay. Uh, it has to be moist so that, in fact, the bucket that you see in the picture, I don't even think we used that particular bucket because it was too dry. Uh, you want clay that's um, that's slightly wet that you can mold into the bottom of these basin shaped pits. Um, and so what we're also finding is some of the sites that are up on these upland sandy soils are near branches or small creeks or water sources where they were likely getting the clay from the pits. So this seems to be uh, factored into site choice uh, when they're building the ovens. Redfish is uh, something that um, uh, is in the Gulf waters of the southern U.S. Uh, it's a very popular fish to eat and catch. And there are ethno-historical accounts um, that Dr. Thompson uh, was describing to us where fish like this was caked in clay and baked in that way the scales could be peeled off the fish easily. So we actually did that in an earth oven uh, on one of the youth camps and we all feasted on on redfish. Uh, it's really cool, very messy uh, <laughs> at the start, but at the end um, it really made scaling the fish a lot easier. Um, and we stuffed the fish, if I recall, with some sassafras leaves for flavoring. And these are some shots of the uh, the holes being made, the um, the kids from the youth camp actually came and and lined these holes, and you see the bucket of uh, sandstone in the background. So this is an important part of the process. So it's it's not as simple as simply just throwing some clay and, and rocks in a hole. The the hole actually has to be cured. The clay has to set. So you have to build a small fire inside of the hole until that clay hardens. Um, and what that allows you to do, that allows you to reuse that that oven uh, numerous times repeatedly um, because you sort of have a hardened base. This is a picture of the sandstone we used. Um, this is not quite as high quality as the stuff that, that would have come from the quarry that they would have been using, but we can get several firings out of this. And part of that initial experimental research we did that I didn't show in the beginning slides, um, I actually took photos of how many times I could fire 
sandstone until it became too degraded to use as a thermal element, until it wouldn't register any capability on the pyrometer. Um, and it really came down to the quality of the sandstone I was using. Um, the, the stuff that you normally find um, just under the ground, sort of on the surface, and not necessarily in a quarry location, you could get two firings out of it, three at most, before it really became degraded. This stuff was in a little bit better location. Um, it's it's taken a little bit longer to form, uh, as you can see. And so we were we've been thus far able to get um, three seasons of firings out of it, and we're going to try for a four. And so you after the the uh, the clay is set, um, you add the rocks and then you heat the rocks um, to get them pretty warm before you start putting your food in the pit. And you know this would have been this would have been a site that you would have seen on um, an early prehistoric site in the hills in the Choctaw homeland. I mean, we have uh, multiple fire pits being fired on some of these sites of various sizes, um, and so we decided to do three or four at once. And I'm going to tell you, it took a couple of us working, like seriously working, to get these things going. And had Ryan sweating uh, at least once out there. Um, you have to gather the fuel, right? Uh, you have to maintain the fires, um, and it takes a good bit of communication and teamwork to, you know, get all of the pits uh, lined with clay, get the clay up from the creek, um, you know. So it's it's a little bit harder than it looks uh, when you think about it. So, you know, you assume that it would be multiple groups of people, you know, pitching in, lending a hand, doing this communally. This is me tying the season into the squirrel. And then this is the bundle, a food bundle wrapped up. Um, this is a mix of uh, um, umbrella leaves and actually collard greens that I had and some uh, Yopon holly um, used to kind of secure the bundle. Uh, and then you place that bundle right on top of the hot stone, put some more stones over it. And then this is a shot of the, the kids at the youth camp actually putting together a, uh, a hastily assembled meadow um, uh, cover uh, for the oven, which we put on top, and then we cover dirt on top of that so that when we remove the cover, uh, we're not dumping a bunch of dirt in the food. So this is real, a really important step. As every, this is the kids pitching in and putting, uh, putting you see how sandy the soils are. Uh, so, you know, if you don't have a cover on top of that, the sand just goes right down into the food. So that palmetto works really well. Um, and, you know, palmetto would have been used for other things as well. We know from from uh, historical documents and oral tradition that they were used uh, to make shelters, um, roosts for shelters and other things. So palmetto is a really handy plant um, and we're using it there. You see Dr. Thompson directing the, the sand placement in this photo. Uh, not sure what he's doing with his hands there. And so you can see this is this is a shot of all the pits covered. Um, uh, can't really even tell they're there. Uh, they almost look invisible on the landscape, but that that's the food cooking right there in the shot. And then as a team, we all grab the the lid and move the the cover off of the food. Um, to check the check the oven, see if the food was done. Um, most of the time, the food's done. We've had some instances where we tried to cook store bought food, uh, such as big picnic roasts and stuff like that, and those didn't do so well. But the wild game that we put in the ovens always seems to do very well. Uh, the squirrels, the fish, the deer meat. Um, so I guess if you have a good uh, a good process, don't try to don't try to change it. Dr. Thompson was kind enough to take a picture of one of our squirrels from this cook. Um, you can see the seasoning that we went through at the beginning. Laid out on the squirrel and inside the squirrel is uh, stuffed with berries and that tenderizes the meat, sweetens the meat a little bit. That's my my grandma's recipe. Uh, and next to it, uh, sort of the the looking leaves. Those are the umbrella magnolia leaves that that were um, heated. And sitting on top of those, the red slices are actually slices of greenbrier root. Uh, now we didn't cook the, the greenbrier root long enough to eat in this particular um, earth oven cooking. It would have taken a lot longer, maybe even an overnight uh, cook to get those 
to where you could actually eat them. We were kind of pressed for time with with having the children out in the forest, but it's a really good uh, good picture of the squirrel. And Dr. Thompson has a really awesome cookbook out that has uh, some of these recipes in it um, and the more traditional histories behind it. I recommend for everyone attending the talk today, if you're interested in traditional foods, Choctaw uh, cooking, um, you should definitely pick that book up. It's uh, it's much worth it. And I also wanted to put a picture in here of the picture on the left is basically an experimental earth oven that we've um, cleaned out. And the picture on the right is actually um, an archaeological feature. Okay. And so you start seeing the similarities. And as sort of a one of the final things I wanted to show you, these are earth ovens that we've been using and reusing for three years now. Um, so you see the nice basin clay pit shapes that they make uh, really look a lot like the archaeological features um, that we're recovering. And we leave the sandstone that we reuse every year on the site next to these pits. So um, they actually start making twin scatters as well. If you were to take a, a drone and throw up in the air and take shots of the site, some of these features would look very um, similar, if not identical, uh, to what we're finding in the archaeological record. So, so what does all this mean? Uh, well, that's a good question. We don't have it all figured out. Um, we know, uh, and I, I just put the squirrel chief uh, uh, in there because it's interesting that you know food is such a socially driven thing. You know, it brings people together. Uh, it has different meanings. Um, you know, the Chickasaw have uh, uh, in ethno-historical documents um, a chief uh, charged with diplomacy that roughly translates to the squirrel chief. And there have been cases where in the archaeological record we found signs of squirrel feasting. Um, is that something that we may see uh, in parts of Choctaw homeland? Um, so, you know, we really have to kind of ask these questions before we can really uh, test them and understand them. And I think that's you know, instead of the traditional archaeological approach, which, um, you know, I started taking, started this research, which was how many calories can these ovens produce and, you know, uh, how long do they, they take to build, you know, sort of that labor uh, cost model. What's more interesting is, you know, what social implications did these ovens have? What types of food uh, were they cooking? And how can we, um, you know, incorporate that into uh, revitalization of tribal life waste. And so the, uh, the bones you see are squirrel bones. They just have cut marks on them. Um, and the, uh, the robe you see is actually from, uh, the subarctic. That is a, I've never seen in my research, I'd never seen a squirrel, uh, robe like that before. And that is from a, a, what they have an Arctic squirrel apparently. Uh, so Ryan and I have not tasted that. Yet. We will one day hopefully dine on an Arctic squirrel before our, our time is up. And so I'll leave everybody with a few questions. You know, what can these sites tell us about the different types of food, the relationships in the region? Um, you know, this area would have perhaps been traditionally part of the Southern district of the Choctaw. Were they uh, eating different foods there? Were they preparing foods differently there later um, in prehistory or earlier in prehistory? Um, and how can this research help build Choctaw knowledge today? Uh, that's really my interest is uh, indigenous lifeways and traditional knowledge. And, and so, yeah, that's, uh, that's my presentation. I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ian Thompson for his support over the years. He's, he's really kept me interested in, uh, in the Pine Hills and uh, um, Ryan Spring and his office. Uh, have been very helpful and University of Alabama has been very supportive of uh, my pursuit of food related knowledge. So uh, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Hey, thanks Mike. That was, that was awesome. Um, I think it really shows how, how important experimental archeology span is, you know, it's better, you know, it's, there's just so much more than to just look at the sites, but when you try to recreate what you're seeing, that really shows you what the people were really doing on the land. And, um, you know, experimental archaeology has just been amazing with our department and trying to revitalize, you know, different Choctaw foodways, different 
um, you know, just culture in general. So, yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, I have a few questions, but um, before I get into that, um, uh, Britt Reed asked, um, how would you recommend processing the sassafras root into powder? I would cut it into thin strips, dry it, and then pound it in a mortar and pestle. Uh, that's pretty much how my grandmother um, processed it. Uh, I leave that work to my mother now. Uh, I'm pretty much in charge of gathering the roots and she, she does the processing. Um, it's, it's my understanding that's, that's the pro they have me cut it up into strips and then she dries it out, pounds it in a mortar and pestle. Okay, so when you mean cut it up into strips, do you mean uh, vertically? Yeah, um, thin strips. Uh, you can um, you can take a potato peeler and peel the outside of the root. Um, it's got kind of a thin skin, and then mm -hmm. just cut it into vertical strips uh, using a kitchen knife, small kitchen knife, like a paring knife. Okay. Uh, Britt also said, do you all think for the Labor Day Festival, we could set up an area for cooking outside? For the duration of Labor Day, yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea. The only problem is out at the village, it's all clay, so we're gonna have to figure out something. But um, yeah, no, I think we could definitely do. We'll work with the Growing Hope program to maybe get some awesome heirloom foods to cook. Uh, Let's see. So Pierce says, I have a question or comment for Mike. Really cool research. Do you think that some of the sandstone was used in stone boiling? Yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, most people when they found sandstone on sites initially in the Gulf South uh, assumed uh, stone boiling. Um, we can't rule that out. Uh, However, where we're finding them in the pits, um, it's more likely, if anything, steam, steam may have been used. Uh, for instance, putting a hole in the top of the pit, having the thermal element inside of the pit, adding water, and it'll steam the food inside. That's a potential possibility. Um, no, I don't. I don't know. Uh, I don't know is the short answer. We really need to do some uh, starch analysis on some of the actual. Uh, sandstone pieces to see um, if there's any remnants, uh, especially in stone boiling, you would get things like that trapped in the stone. I know there were a couple that's done on the Pearl River County sites. Um, they found uh, what they were calling um, poverty. Uh, they were like poverty point objects, the big baked clay balls, mm -hmm. but they weren't decorated and they weren't, they were, they were sort of just kind of clumped together. And so they were called Pine Hills objects, PHOs. They just made a new name for it because they didn't know what to call them. Uh, they tested some of those and found rabbit blood. Uh, and so one of the theories there were they were, at, and, you know, you find these baked clay balls uh, in conjunction with these uh, sandstone clay features. So there was some speculation by archaeologists that they may have been doing, uh, um, you know, stone boiling with those clay balls uh, and maybe cooking rabbits. I don't know, but I do think there needs to be more done in that arena. That's a really good question. Awesome. Uh, Pierce also said, I hope Elliot is being nice to you. <laughs> Tell Pierce um, he is. He's being well behaved. Deanna asks, I have some sassafras in my freezer now. Is it possible to take strips off at a, at a time to dry and preserve it? Or is there another way to store it? Hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I'll ask my mom. My mom would know the answer to that. I'll email you the answer to that, Deanna. I say we've never try it. Just we, try yeah, it. we've never we've never froze it. Honestly, we just go out and pick it fresh. So uh, yeah, that would be something to check out. Um, Deanna also asks, what are the similarities and or differences of the sandstone stones and the cooking stones from Poverty Point? Well, the poverty point um, stones uh, are actually baked clay objects. I'm assuming she's asking about. Um, mm -hmm. They're they are. I mean, they're almost like works of art. Uh, they have very defined um, types that they're using. 
um, and they're decorated. Uh, obviously, we don't have that type of stone in the Pine Hills. We have citronelle chert, which can be very stubborn um, <laughs> to work with, uh, and they're not making those poverty point type objects uh, other than the few sort of um, glob together Pine Hills objects uh, that we find. Um, you know, there's a big difference there, uh, but they are using sandstone and the sandstone that we've got um, in the lower, you know, areas of the Pine Hills just isn't that high quality stuff, except for a few quarry locations where you can nap items out of um, actually make tools out of. Um, it's pretty rare to find a sandstone point, for instance, uh, on some of these sites. Uh, so, yeah, it's just the quality of sandstone. And plus, the area has been logged, um, so we may have lost a lot of information as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Plus, archaeologists got a really late start trying to understand the area and protect some of these areas. If there is a silver lining, at least the, the Soto National Forest uh, encompasses a large land base there in that area. So there could be potential to, to recover more. Right. Um, so Britt also asks, have you found a difference in cooking style between the three districts of the Choctaw Nation and the homelands? And um, I know that there just hasn't been a lot of archeology span done in Mississippi, especially on Choctaw sites. Mm -hmm. um, but what no, do you think, Mike? Yeah, that's, that's a great point, Ryan. Uh, and that, that's exactly what I was gonna say. I, you know, that's an excellent question. One that, um, you know, I'm gonna try to focus on the Southern district areas in my dissertation research if I can. Uh, but we just don't have a lot of information. There's a um, there's some really good excavations that have been done in Kemper County, uh, Mississippi in the past uh, 10 years. Um, but not really a uh, not any excavations of substance, um, especially asking those type of questions uh, to my knowledge. Um, but I defer to Ryan to answer that one. He's, he sees the maps more so than I do, probably. Um, yeah, I think, Britt, that's something we need to look into a lot more to be a great project to work on with the community. Um, um, so Britt asks, have we seen this cooking style used in Choctaw Nation uh, post Trail of Tears? Um, no, mostly because um, of our use of cast iron in the 1800s and really relying on uh, moving away from a lot of these traditional cooking techniques to utilizing cast iron. Uh, which uh, that actually leads me to one of my questions, Mike, is um, what's the, uh, the differences uh, in comparison you see between the earth ovens and uh, cast iron cooking uh, or, um, or Dutch oven cooking? Yeah, I mean, they're very similar. Uh, you know, the advantages, obviously, to a Dutch oven is are the seasoning uh, that you have in your in your cast iron. Uh, Lord knows my grandma wouldn't let me ever use her cast iron. It was so well cared for and seasoned. Um, but uh, but in terms of the actual temperature, um, in some ways, it's actually a little easier to use uh, an earth oven than a Dutch oven, um, especially when you're cooking things like bread. Uh, I find that in my Dutch ovens, um, when I'm camping and stuff, I tend to burn the bread a lot easier uh, in my Dutch oven than I do just a traditional earth oven. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there are differences, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the kind of cool thing about these types of earth ovens that we're seeing are the way that they're constructed with the clay linings, they can be reused repeatedly. Um, so in that sense, it is sort of like, um, you know, site furniture, if you will, right? You have a, you know, we have a Dutch oven in our kitchen and a crock pot and they have this uh, earth oven, you know, on the spot on the site. I think the more puzzling pieces to it are, you know, how do we explain the sites that have a bunch of these? <laughs> you know, like, are they contemporary? Um, and some of the dates we've gotten off a few of the sites show that they are, um, but we don't have enough of a sample size to really say. And so that's a question I think that could be carefully looked at. Another thing, even though we don't have large excavation areas, um, and this is sort of to your other question, uh, Brett, is uh, we do have reports that map some of these feature types, um, and we have photographs that map some of these feature types. 
So if, if we were to go through and kind of look at through some of these, that's where the, some of this data came from was from that Pearl River County site. Uh, it was in a published site. It was in a gray literature report somewhere. I, I managed to find it. And even though they just called them hearths, one, two, three, and four features 27, we were able to see from the photos that they're definitely different types um, and where they're at on the site and that sort of thing. So there's still a lot of work that can be done uh, even with the stuff that's already been excavated uh, to take a look at and see if we can figure something out. But yeah, I love my Dutch oven though. I still I still bring it with me everywhere and and uh, and use it a lot, but sometimes the earth oven's the way to go, you know? Mm -hmm. That's great. And you know, the archeology span in Oklahoma too, you know, archeologists may have never even looked for earth ovens. So, um, you know, maybe something we gotta go back and, you know, look at as well. Uh, just because, you know, we have a modern technology doesn't mean it was always the best way, you know, the, the best, the best use. So, yeah, that's, um, let's see. How far do you think they were having to either transport or trade that sandstone? Are we, you know, talking, you know, uh, a few just, miles or are we talking? Yeah, just, just for the sandstone that we used for the youth camps, um, that sandstone was easily four miles away. And that's as the crow flies. So, you know, doesn't mean that it may have been longer uh, um, walking. But, yeah, we were driving. It was three miles away just to get that sandstone. Um, in areas on Camp Shelby, uh, I, I spent many weekends trying to source sandstone locations, and you would find um, nicer sandstone locations on what they call nick points in, in first order drainages, where basically um, the way the wall goes to the creek, it erodes a spot down deep enough to where you get to the edge of a, uh, you nick the edge of a sandstone deposit. Um, and we mapped a few of those, but when look and when you look at the maps of where we're looking at some of these sites and then look at where those places are located, they're miles away. Um, so we don't think that they're trading in uh, sandstone. We think that they are getting it locally, but uh, extra locally, if you will, right? Um, and they're they're having to put some labor in to get it on the site and get it in the quantities too. I'm talking about, I think go back on the pictures here. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, we're not talking about a few, um, you know, a few pieces of sandstone. Uh, we're talking, you know, bucket loads. Let's see. Let me go back up to picture. Are, are any of these sites near water? You know, where they've transported them by canoe? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, some of the sites are near water, but we're not talking huge water sources. Um, and the hydrology has changed due to land um, management practices, right? Especially due to the timbering uh, yeah. in that area. Very well likely could have gotten canoes through um, some of those areas, uh, you know, prior to the, the massive um, destruction of the Longleaf Forest there. Uh, so that is something to think about. Um, this particular site in Pearl River County is near a nice body of water um, that even to this day you can get a canoe down. In fact, it's called Murder Creek. Very <laughs> pleasant sounding name of a place to stay. But, uh, but yeah, and I'm thinking that's probably being the clay. The site selection mm -hmm. may be based on being able to get nice moist clay. Um, but there's other stuff going on too. And some of the locations where there are uh, multiple feature types like this, there are a lot of good for tortoise. Um, and that's interesting. Um, hmm. So, um, you know, one of the things that I've noticed throughout the presentation is that physically and intellectually, this type of cooking took a lot of skill. You know, this is something that, you know, people would have to have perfected over, you know, a period of time. And I think it's, um, I think it's just worth saying that, you know, all the prep work and everything that goes into this is not um, primitive by any means. No, I agree. Uh, you know, trying to understand uh, even how to engineer this with the modern uh, capabilities that we have, you know, for instance, just trucking in items and using plastic buckets and things like that. Um, yeah, it would have been a uh, would have been very 
uh, much the same issues that um, indigenous people were, were solving, the same obstacles, um, and they were likely doing it in a better way than we were doing it. <laughs> you know, um, mm -hmm. and, and it also shows a connection to the land uh, that I think is important. Um, yeah. You know, the Pine Hills were being actively uh, used, the resources were being used, um, people were living there. Uh, there were obviously social aspects um, to eating and cooking here that we don't yet quite understand, uh, but were important. And so um, it's nice to have the um, some of the youth from from Oklahoma, from the Choctaw, come back and, and see the trees and see the place and see the land and be able to participate in, in this. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's important. Mm -hmm. um. Do we see any of these earth ovens on other Choctaw sites or even um, uh, ancestral Choctaw sites uh, during, yeah, even during found, Mississippian times? Yeah, they found, uh, um, I think Lubbock Creek had a couple uh, earth ovens found, or earth oven type features. But again, you're still, you're faced with that challenge of how were they identified, you know, as simple hearths, as, um, you know, pit features. Um, Sometimes those features get misinterpreted as storage features when, in fact, they're they could be clay line pits for cooking. Uh, but yeah, we all along the Tennessee Tom Bigby waterway, there are sites that have evidence of this type of technology, especially late woodland, early Mississippian period. Um, and then the known village site in Kemper County, that very first uh, uh, slide I showed you, you know, that is a historic Choctaw site, and that's a Sure enough, earth oven. Um, now that doesn't date to the necessarily the historic period. That's from one of the uh, the earlier sites near that site. But it wouldn't be too much of a think that that would have been uh, something still actively used by the tribe. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a a large range period that people have been using these earth ovens. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so um, when I first started. Sorry, when I first started looking at these, uh, I thought this would be merely uh, a purely a uh, middle archaic um, feature type. Uh, you know, during the climatic events of the the mid Holocene, you know, things drying out, people trying to look for different technologies to to be able to find more food. Um, but that's not the case. I mean, we find these. You know, not not just in the archaic time period, but um, many, many woodland sites uh, and late woodland sites and late middle woodland sites uh, all through the Pine Hills have these these feature types. And although we don't have an abundance of quote unquote Mississippian period sites in the Pine Hills, it could be a function of the uh, the heavy logging industry having destroyed those sites in the area and or they may be living a more traditional lifestyle with less, uh, you know, agriculturally intensive activities going on in those acidic soils. I, and I don't think we have the answer, and we have an incomplete archaeological record. So I just don't think the the answer to that. Um, okay. Um, the type of habitation in the Pine Hills from this type of research is this: people that are are they living around this type of thing? Are they um, doing this a certain distance away from their homes? Is it just like a, a winter thing? Uh, what do you, what do we know about the, um, the occupation type? You know, we don't, we can't say too terribly much about seasonality because of the soils. The soils eat up most of the and uh, mm -hmm. micro botanical remains that we could pull from the site to be able to answer that question. Traditionally, it was thought that there was some type of seasonal round between the coast uh, and the uplands, um, perhaps, you know, even going up into the uplands for the hunting season and coming back down uh, to feast on shellfish and that sort of thing down on the coast. Um, we don't know, though, and some of the sites, frankly, are large and long term and likely multi seasonal. Uh, you know, the artifact assemblages from some of these sites show the full range of uh, production values and everything from tool technologies to ceramics. Um, we occasionally even find whole pot breaks on some of these sites that are hard to explain. Uh, so, you know, we don't necessarily have structures, um, but then again, they may have been using uh, wood 
um, posts and palmetto and things like that that didn't survive uh, the acidic soils of the archaeological record and or the logging uh, that went through the area. So short answer is they're living there a long time. They're obviously occupying some of these sites for a long time and doing a wide range of activities on some of these sites. On others, it's harder to say. Um, and I know Dr. Jackson, uh, who's now retired out of University of Southern Mississippi, spent a long time using remote sensing, trying to figure out uh, the answer to some of those questions. Um, unfortunately, Winterville pulled him away <laughs> from, I think, getting to the, the the root causes, if you'll pause the pun, uh, part of the pun there, but uh, but yeah, these are answers. These are questions we still have, um, and I think questions that are important. It it just shows, um, you know, the the lack of archaeology done in our homelands, um, but also um, the opportunities that we have for the future, uh, especially for you know a lot of uh, we need. We need Choctaw archaeologists, we need Choctaw ethnologists, you know, we need our Choctaws to um, get expertise in these areas. Um, you know, the, the chat has been talking about um, just how this reflects that communal aspect of cooking, um, you know, how this could have been used for, um, you know, just families, or it could have been used for feasting, you know, with large communities too. So I think, um, I think this earth oven technology is definitely really interesting stuff. And it, you know, it looks like the community thinks so. So thank you, Mike. I really, I really appreciate uh, you coming and talking with us. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. I learn so much every time I spend time with the Choctaw and hope to continue spending uh, more time. Hopefully the pandemic lifts and everybody stays healthy and we're able to get together and communally feast again. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that wraps up our Tosholi for today. Um, I thank you everyone that have um, come to watch and listen, and I thank uh, everyone that will uh, watch the recording in the future. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to reach out to the Historic Preservation Department. Um, we'll get those to Mike. Um, and, you know, thank you, Megan, for setting all this up and this opportunity. Thank you, Mike. That was great. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you for hosting. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone. Um, and so our next chapter to show you will, will be will be with um, Dr. Valerie Lambert, an associate professor of anthropology at the University of North Carolina. And she and I will be talking about um, Choctaw kind of political actions in the 1950s um, and kind of um, the, the anti-termination movement that um, our community kind of went through and all of that. And it'll be a great talk and I'm looking forward to it. So I'll see you all um, on December 8th at 12 p.m. Thanks. Bye. Hey, can, I, can I add a, a quick plug? Yes, go for it. So I wanted to um, um, Elampachi Southeastern Traditional Foods Facebook page. It's a it's a group that was established by um, Brit of um, different Choctaw and other Southeastern community members that have come together to talk about uh, Southeastern traditional foods. So um, you know, give it a look up on uh, Facebook and. Um, and I really appreciate our Choctaw community and Southeastern community for pushing on these traditions. Ryan, can you post that in the chat? Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Peace out, Chiki.